half throughout the world we have been talking about the climate crisis the climate change as the uh, un official negotiations go or the government plans go uh, basically uh, i want to focus a little away from that and bring in the aspect that what capitalism and the rise of capitalism has done is capitalism is, is nothing new but what the uh, overall global domination of capitalist culture capitalist ideology has done is not only create a climate crisis it's actually or a climate change crisis it's actually destabilizing the entire arts natural systems so i want to uh, focus on that and give a few hints around that and uh, before i do that i'll uh, uh, request on the shishuranjan to give me uh, a marker when i started 30 minutes and then i will com uh, complete in another 5 6 minutes is it okay uh, yes come yes uh, fine so because here uh, downstairs i have a watch in the uh, clock in front of me here i don't have so you please uh, keep the time for 30 minutes from uh, when i started and then another 5 6 so if we go back into human civilizational history uh, say something or even a little little beyond that then we see that change in nature is a process that we humans have started implanting the earth in a somewhat visible way from around 6 to 7000 years ago much before even what we know as spread of civilization and that particular signature in the earth's atmosphere is there you can see the level of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases change even before 7000 years and that we know now very clearly is a contribution of fast spread of agriculture and as we know agriculture spread by uh, cutting down or burning either forests or grasslands so that obviously when it happened in a global scale that will have a significant impact on the earth's atmosphere and the lithosphere but if we look at that the impact on the earth was minimum very very small it was visible to the science the scientific eye the scientific instrument but as a whole except the extinction of a large variety of megafauna megafauna is an are animals which are something like 25 kg and above so there was an historically there was an extinction of megafauna when agriculture started spreading from the fertile crescent in the middle east to other parts of the world except in the continent of africa all other continents bear that signature but beyond that the other in environmental impacts the ecological impacts we don't see much signature at a global scale what happened even with the rise of civilization which we know happened around started happening around 7000 years ago in the again in the sumer sumer region southern southern iraq today southern iraq and then spread in that area and then in many other parts of, it, of the world we had another clear impact and signature of human activities on earth systems and here i want to introduce earth systems the earth systems the climate is generally perceived as rain storms heat this kind of things but the earth systems actually there are nine connected earth system which control all natural phenomena on the earth and those you find very little impact before a few centuries from now but even with that we have very little signature of what our civilization created and i'll jump start from that time onward i am going back a little with the purpose to show that even with the very fast rise of population in the world even with the very fast spread of agriculture throughout the world the impact on our systems were very very small which except on one area which is as i said the extinction of megafauna in almost all continents except africa that is visible that is visible to science but other than that on the atmosphere on our daily living patterns on the climate and all other earth systems and uh, in between briefly i'll say what are the earth system 
there are very little impact. But this thing started changing from around 1800, 1850 onwards. We all know what happened around time. In fact, 1760, uh, it's every children has gone through this, that the industrial revolution, quote unquote, the industrial revolution. But one thing that has not been mentioned in books is three different things converged around uh, 1800 to 1850, without which neither the industrial civilization nor the industrial extractive industrial capitalism that we know today. And I am uh, repeating all these separate words. This is a combination, extractive industrial capitalism. The rise of extractive industrial capitalism would not have been possible without the convergence of three things out of which one or two are highlighted in history, which all of us have studied. And that one or two are, one thing is said that the invention of the steam engine or the betterment of the steam engine, the steam engine that is mechanical power. Till that point, human beings, which, were, which already became almost the dominant species on the earth, they had animal power and human power and a little bit of wind power and water power. But the moment mechanical power in the form of the early improved steam engine from both Stevenson and then James Watt, this became available, one major quantum jump in how much energy and power you control, one human being or a small group of human beings can control. That's one major element. The second major element, which we almost, uh, it is almost absent from general history taught, is the both the invention, uh, sorry, not the invention, but the uh, finding of large scale coal deposits and the combination of large scale coal deposit and the steam engine, which is the mechanical power. Because one thing uh, one has to understand, the moment coal became available in very large scale for extraction, the amount of energy that you can control in one place became magnified. Because before that, the primary large scale energy source was either from the sun, which is very dilute, or from wood. So you cannot control or you cannot accumulate too much of a forest, too much of a wood by one family or one small group. But the moment coal deposits in mining became available and it combined with the mechanical power of the steam engine, this became a major jump in availability of energy to the human society. And the third thing that converged around that same time, as all of us know, before this, three to four centuries before this, the European traders, the trading houses and the trading that happened accumulated huge amount of capital. Not only the kings and uh, kings and emperors, but also the traders accumulated huge amount of capital. As many of you might know that gold uh, controlled by Medici family in Italy and the money and the, uh, uh, the emergence of notes instead of gold, emergence of note by the rich trading families, all this happened before the rise of industrial revolution. But once these three things converge, large capital, mechanical, large amounts of mechanical power, which can be controlled by either one person or a very small group, and access to very large energy deposit in the form of coal mines. Now look at it, you can have energy of a few trees or even a hundred trees, you can employ your family or even a little bigger and cut down trees and burn all them to get energy. But the amount of energy one small coal mine can give you, one very small coal mine, which has only say around 5 million tons of coal, the amount of energy it can give is immensely greater than the amount of energy you can get from home. But the um, one person to get access or to control of the coal mine you have to have access to large amount of capital. You can go to the forest and cut down a few trees, but to buy or to let take lease of one full coal mine, you need large amounts of capital. And also when the coal mines operate, the flooding, the water coming out or the mechanical taking out of the soil, all that needed the mechanical power, which earliest was provided by the steam engine. So the convergence of these three started the first rise of extractive industrial capitalism. 
capital in terms of large accumulation through earlier trading in terms of large amount of power by the mechanical power and concentrated source of energy those three three extraction of concentrated source of energy which is over large human time scales non renewable so these three converge together around 1800 to 1850 to start rise of this in extractive industrial capitalism which today is wrecking havoc throughout the world so i uh, wanted to go back to history here because these are missed out let me come back quickly to 100 years later because if you look at the atmospheric record the oceanic record and the lithosphere record lithosphere is the part of the earth which is the rock the soil uh, the immediate layers above and beyond that below that so all three the oceans the atmosphere and the lithosphere if you look at the records you see three layer point demarcation point one as i said is earlier before the rise of extractive industrial capitalism but the two others are very clear one is around 1900 just from starting before 1900 you see a very clear sharp rise in both carbon dioxide amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere the lithospheric deposits and amount of carbon dioxide and the ph change in ocean starting so this is one point and we also need to understand why this happened if you look at what point of time capitalism started controlling very large amount of energy and very large amount of extractive production processes this is one as i said coal capital large capital and mechanical power starting around 1800 but around 1900 petroleum which is normally called oil started being extracted in massive scale first in the usa and then globally wherever this is available so petroleum extraction started in massive scale again the same extractive industrial capitalism because the petroleum extraction also need very large capital access to high technology access to mechanical power for extraction of that resources so these three so 1900 onwards we see a very clear change of the earth system which is for any scientific inquiry which is visible clearly both in the atmospheric carbon dioxide and lithospheric deposits again in around 1950 we see another sharp change here we have to have another there are there is one more change i will point out to and then i'll come to why i'm saying this needs to be understood in terms of where the signature on the earth's atmosphere and lithosphere shows and how you can understand that in terms of what kind of economic political economic structure the world goes through or world is dominated by at that point of time starting before that time and going beyond that time around 1950 we again see starting 1950 we again see a sharp rise so one sharp rise is there around 1900 there is another sharp rise in the curve around 1950 and if you consider what happened in 1950 there are several things that we know which changed uh, even what the form that capitalism was extractive industrial capitalism was running the form changed all of us must be knowing about the 1944 washington consensus and the 1944 coming out of both the world bank and imf and they started dominating the economic paradigm of most of the countries so 1944 that uh, conference out of which the world bank and imf was created to dominate the world economic pattern and which was also in the background we have to also understand 1917 uh, the us ussr was created the bolshevik revolution there was a parallel which was visible in the world there is one model and the larger part of the world the western world the us the europe japan all of them of course japan was devastated in that period but all of them adopted the capitalistic model whereas the soviet union adopted a different model but not very different in terms of extractive industrialism only thing was the capital was controlled more by state and a large part of it was used for serving the common people's interest but the model of extractive industrialism was not different 
again you see a change i'm jumping because we don't have time for a very long time to explain all this but i would request uh, all of you to see this clear changes as i said 1950 onwards one change was very clear there was a sharp reaction to both the second world war ending around that time 1945 and the rise of soviet union which was a global power which became a global power out of the second world war and beyond that to 1990 so again in 1990 we see a sharp change but before that let me just point out that 1950s had a, another very significant change which in the extractive industrial capitalism affected on the world before that if you see the all the world's war mechanism hundreds and thousands of factories were set up to create uh, war machines aeroplanes tanks ships guns uh, uh, ammunition everything so what do you do with all that so during that time this uh, washington consensus creation of the world bank and imf and the uh, us marshall plan to so called reconstruct europe uh, revitalize europe all that turned all these war making industrial capacity into consumer goods so from that point onward we see individual families which subsisted on much lower consumption before the second world war becoming large scale consumers so the focus of the extractive industrial capitalism again shifted from consumption by large scale factories and other industries to individual families becoming consumers that means their consumer consuming became a mantra a, a desirable quality a goodness the more you can consume the better you are so 1945 to 50 this was very clearly visible and this kept on increasing so you again see the signature of this both in the atmosphere and in the lithosphere and if one looks at the carbon dioxide and ghg carbs in uh, atmosphere there is a very clear signature again around the 1950s the third point of this change and here i'll come quickly after saying uh, uh, pointing out this timeline i'll come to what are the earth system changing uh, 19 around 1990 we all know what happened globally in the political scene but surprisingly you again see a change in the global atmospheric and lithospheric record i am not talking about the 1950s uh, 45s and 50s uh, uh, 50 40s and 50s large number of atomic energy tests uh, nuclear bomb test where the lithospheric record is there that is there that's a separate record i am talking about the record of consumerism which is very clearly visible in atmosphere and lithosphere and anyone which can who can look into the atmospheric ghg levels can see that so this change from extractive industrial capitalism getting huge amount of energy and mechanical power to around 1950s turning individual families and people into consumers becoming consumerism becoming the most desirable quality and in the 1990s again you see after what was uh, historical historically called the end of history after the soviet union collapsed because it was projected that the global alternative vision has ended so now now there is only one way where humanity will go forward will progress will go for development and that is the consumerist capitalist way of development and you have to understand that in this background today the globally accepted uh, what we call environmental compacts there are three globally accepted and even even uh, created environmental compacts where very large number of countries including uh, russia china everyone are members of all three came out of the 1992 earth summit <clears throat> and the 1992 earth summit took place in the background of 1990s 1990 when the soviet union collapsed when the global public opinion was moved towards okay the other alternative that was being shown didn't work so our alternative that is the western world us and europe alternative of capitalist industrial development is the only way to go forward in this background the 1992 arts summit happened out of the arts summit 
came out three global environmental compacts. One is the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. One was the UNCBD, United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. The third was UNCCD, the United Nations Convention on Combating Desertification. So these three today, from 1992 to 2022, 30 years, these three are globally accepted environmental compacts where all countries in a multi-country environment under the UN auspices, they negotiate, they decide, and these all three were created in the background of end of other alternatives. So it's no surprise that from that point onwards, all the environmental alternatives that has been proposed have been proposed within the extractive industrial capitalist framework. Because people ask, why is it that it's the only framework that's being presented to us? You have to understand the background where all these environmental governance, the global environmental governance, the national environmental governance, they are coming out of these three environmental, global environmental compacts, and all three came out in this background. So let me now come to what is the art system, what are the art systems and what status they are now, why I'm saying the art systems are being destabilized now. This is the first time in recorded human history. I'm not talking about 100,000 years ago or 1,500,000 years ago when art was in a hotter state because as humans, we existed in as hunter-gatherers. But as till the time we started agriculture around uh, 11,000 years ago or 10,700 years ago in a large scale, if you look at the uh, global climate in the last 10,000 years, which is called the Holocene period, in the last 10,000 years, the global temperature, average temperature has never veered beyond one degree Celsius up and down, 10,000 years. That means it's an extremely stable climate that we have faced and that has facilitated human agriculture, human civilization and human enterprise as a whole. But in the last 100 years, out of that, we have exceeded one point, we have now crossed 1.2 degrees. So this is affecting our system there, as I said, there are nine connected earth systems starting right from the Arctic Ocean and the Greenland, the two polar caps, the global ocean currents, the Amazon and other rainforest connectivities, including the Sahara connectivity. So these are the kind of uh, global earth systems, which in if you destabilize one system, the other system also gets destabilized. For example, if the Sahara which, became, which becomes wetter. People will say, oh, it's very good. A desert is becoming wetter. But people generally don't pay attention that both the Atlantic fisheries, Atlantic is one of the best fisheries along with Pacific, the Atlantic fisheries and the Amazon rainforest depend on very fine dust blown by high speed wind from the Sahara. So one system getting changed affects two, three, four other art systems. And if supposing the uh, Sahara gets more wet, then the Atlantic fisheries might collapse. Similarly, as might you might not know, the Amazon rainforest, which often has been called the lungs of the earth, is the soil there is not fertile. So it depends on blown Saharan mineral dust, mineral rich dust for its fertility. So if that gets reduced, the Amazon rainforest start getting down. So this kind of global earth system connectivity is there. Today, what we are seeing that the Amazon rainforest, along with the Northern Boreal forest, which is the largest amount of forest, much larger than the Amazon rainforest, the Northern Boreal forest, which starts in Canada, the east uh, Western parts of Canada, goes up to Siberia, to Northern Europe, the Nordic countries, so this is the largest forest area in the world. Today, there are massive scale forest diebacks in the, in the boreal forest. Today, large parts of the Amazon has become a carbon emitter. Rather than being a carbon sink, parts of Amazon, fairly significant chunks of the Amazon are becoming carbon emitters. Today, it's the world scientists who are working on Arctic and Greenland, they're worried that what is called the blue ocean event, 
if the arctic becomes ice free for a large part in the summer it might never go back to a ice cover in the winter complete ice cover in the winter never go back because the earth has different stable state so this kind of earth systems today are being destabilized the scientists who are working for last 30 35 years on the arctic systems they are afraid that the uh, blue ocean event might happen within 2030 the first blue ocean event which will be a massively destabilizing event today there is a very clear infrared signature that the earth's global heat conveyor as we all know the wind carries heat and energy but far larger amount of heat and energy is carried by the ocean currents which not only is the atlantic current but which starts from the antarctic in the antarctic ocean southern ocean which goes via all the oceans and reaches the arctic and dips down and come back to the antarctic so this is the largest energy carrier in the world natural energy carrier today there is a very clear signature if you look at infrared images of the north atlantic you'll see a cold blob which is called a cold blob it's a blue color uh, artificial color uh, that is uh, color enhanced image why that is happening because huge amount of ice is melting from the greenland ice cap which is sits next to that uh, that northern part and this is today the greenland ice cap is losing ice at 8 6 to 8 times the rate that was a historic rate of the last few centuries 6 to 8 times and that rate that cold ice melt water is causing this uh, water of the north atlantic to become lighter because this is fresh water coming into the saline water so the water which is being carried from equatorial region is not able to dip down as a result it is not only the uh, current slowing down you see huge amount of heat build up in the equatorial region today it is no not a secret it is public news every two days that china is facing is historically largest or longest heat wave chinese heat wave has crossed 78 days europe has faced massive amount of heat wave and drought and wildfires pakistan has faced which they called a monsoon and monsoon with massive amount of flooding which exceeded the massive flooding of the 2010 uh, us you know last year have faced this kind of thing so what i am trying to say is today we are not talking about climate change only we are talking about complete earth systems getting destabilized and maybe at the point of collapse the earth is huge earth system inertia is huge that's why it might not happen in the 5 or 10 years but scientists are afraid that in the next 20 years the total earth system collapse might collapse uh, earth systems many of them are might might collapse in face of this this will be my last observation during this uh, presentation in the face of this what has this global environmental governance and the global environmental compacts have done in the unf people see if you look at this the paris agreement was presented as a big triumph after that the climate change will be controlled if you look at what has actually happened the capitalist world and who is now driving this capitalist world which and i'll come back to 1990s there is one more change in the capitalist uh, stru structure and the paradigm which happened in around 1945 to 50 after 1990s if you look at it the capital link through actual uh, physical production started getting more and more dilute so the capital started to exploit and turn it into financial capitalism from controlling the means of production from only controlling the means of production now capital has shifted has learned a new method where you don't even need to do production so financial capitalism capitalism turning into financial capitalism has started from 1990s and it has intensified immensely that's why you see the global stock exchanges the high speed trading overnight of entire countries economy collapsing economic hitmans so this is not a result of production oriented capitalism this is not a result of capital
controlling the means of production and using labor to produce and sell and profit that was old hat that has become uh, almost as a, a second rate uh, instrument for capitalism today the first rate instrument for the first choice instrument of capitalism is financial capitalism and what has happened in this you see there is still a connection very clear connection because energy is one thing you cannot do without producing that energy uh, you can generate but you can produce so after paris agreement let me come back to what has capitalism done because this today as i said the global model is that all of this crisis will be solving within the existing structure of extractive industrial capitalism only by reducing it uh, reducing the consumption only by increasing the efficiency but even there if you look at what has happened after the paris agreement which was high globally in the five years after paris agreement in 2015 december 16 17 18 19 only in 20 the global emissions dipped but 16 onward to 2019 all the global emissions kept on increasing in this five years the global financial institutions the ifis the international financial institution 60 biggest financial institution in the world they invest 5 trillion dollars in same fossil fuels coal oil and gas if you look at even today the biggest investments that are going today is coal and oil so all this in the name of saving the climate but what we are not recognizing is that this very model of capital doing its own uh, correction is now obsolete outdated many of the groups in europe us other countries have started questioning this many people's groups many movements but we don't see a global movement as we have seen during the occupy movement the occupy wall street movement in 2011 which started there there was a ray of hope that this uh, focusing on financial capitalism and this though it is not exactly numerically correct but this technically 1% and 99% that also meant who controls 99% of the capital and who controls who are the 1% of the capital but the 99% of the people so this debate has again died down so in the global governmental environmental governance sphere environmental governance sphere not only in the climate sphere but even ecc even cbd even ccd all of this and now from 2015 onwards the sdgs the sustainable development goals all of them are focusing sustaining the capitalistic industrial financial capitalism production and financialization but with more efficiency with a more human face and the uh, so called slogan of leaving no one behind even that is not happening even that sdg slogan which is the globally accepted now leave no one behind that means even the poorest person give them something they can live on they can sustain themselves but there is the question of equity the question of justice is not there the globally accepted environmental governance framework under the un which all countries governments have accepted is based on that that same extractive industrial capitalistic model but with a human face with so called things of circular economy which will reduce your consumption a bit but do not talk about consumption level do not talk about who controls and whether we can keep on growing economically and industrially because already we have crossed the limits of the earth which is given by the ecological footprint the ecological footprint the maximum ecological capacity of the earth is around 12.92 billion global hectares we are consuming today at a rate of 1.8 times that much so it's the earth is giving clear signature that the earth systems capacities have been exceeded already so within this given earth systems and very clearly as many movements globally have raised clearly there is no planet b because we are creating massive destabilization in the earth system this industrial extractive capitalism is creating massive destabilization which the coming generations will have to answer and they do not have a model because human civilization have not seen an earth 
that we are trying to push, push the earth to the earth system to which was there there 150,000 years ago when we didn't have a civilization we are just hunter gatherers i'm reminding this so this is second level this is a massive crime and injustice against the coming generations that is an intergenerational injustice and equity and the third level of crime and inequity and injustice is interspecies injustice and inequity because as human species though this is not created by the entire humanity but whoever is doing it belongs to the homo sapiens species human beings but there are roughly 8 million other species of life on earth so what we are doing pushing the earth to is creating a condition where more than 1 million species of other animals plants insects are facing extinction so this is the third level of massive injustice inequity and a crime is against life itself life in a very large number of species we are pushing to extinction so there is this is high time that we abandon the idea that this global art system crisis can be solved within the industrial capitalistic framework or the industrial or financial capitalistic framework we have to start searching and there are many other models we don't have we'll discuss this afterwards there are many other models that are being discussed but we have to first think this model of capitalistic industrial development and financial capitalism both of this which is destroying the art has to be dismantled and today the un climate and environmental governance system has clearly failed so their only alternative is people's movement and people's movements in small scale won't work because we have thousands and tens of thousands of people's movements small and medium here and there countries and regions but today if we need to destabilize the global financial capitalism and global industrial extractive capitalism we need a global scale people's movement which raises this fundamental question raises the fundamental question about what kind of economy what kind of nature dependence what kind of extraction you do and a fundamental idea of what kind of human society we need to build up so i'll end here and uh, expect a good discussion thank you yeah uh, thank you comrade so uh, thanks a lot uh, comrade uh, we have got few questions uh, from whatsapp uh, i just would like to put over to you so comrade niranjan has asked one question uh, that is uh, what does the greater example greater sunberg example teach us on a, on developing a movement for protection of ecology what is a greater greater sunberg example teach us on developing a movement for production of protection of uh, ecology okay let me let me be very frank in this see uh, uh, all of us know this very well that this started as a very well organized somewhat corporate model uh, initiative when greta thunberg started fasting uh, or sorry uh, sitting down in front of the swedish parliament once a week on fridays the TVs were there. We don't have time is a corporate model NGO, which was ready with this. She was in the board. So this started as a corporate model global uh, initiative, which had a business model. See, today, uh, if you follow this world, many of the NGOs have a business model. They have a theory of change, but they also have a business model. So this started as a business model. But this somehow, because this was a young girl, doing her own exercise, sitting down in front of the Swedish parliament. This is a country which is one of the richest countries. This is a country where the human development index is one of the highest. So a girl from that kind of a society who had no other sort of uh, demands, who no other sort of wants, nothing lacking. If a girl from that society can come out and protest, that somehow caught the imagination of a lot of young people in the world and a lot of older people also. So from a more NGO oriented, corporate business model oriented NGO initiative, which it was to begin with, and Greta has accepted that, yes, 
She said, yes, I was part of this. We don't have time, corporate NGO, but now I don't have anything to do with it. So she had it several times. So that somehow triggered the imagination. But if you look at it, it has always voiced its demand in a very vague manner. It has raised demand, take climate action. Climate justice now is a slogan which originated in the climate justice now movement of the late 1990s and early 2000s. So now all of them have taken climate justice now. What does that mean to a person? The government can say we are doing climate justice. By putting more solar power, we are doing climate justice. So the demands that Greta and her movement of ideas for future, which she leads, have failed to actually bring down this. Of course, he is learning. I'm not holding it against her. He is a young girl. He is learning quite well. But as of now, they have failed to raise this point that the capitalistic model of development is the root cause of this. And you have to dismantle that system to come back to a stable art that she has still not been able to see or her entire group. But I hope because she has a very good group of scientific advisors, a lot of good scientists she reaches out to and a lot of older people, good scientists advises that group out of good faith. So we hope that that will turn into a better movement. But as of now, that will not go, that will not change the world. And one, yeah. one clear point here, if you look at the response of industry, the UN to Greta's, uh, Greta's speeches, they all clap, they all appreciate her speeches. If you go and demand the dismantling of the capitalist system, they will arrest you. So there is a difference. So, like, uh, we can call it as a direct hypocrisy of UN over here. Yeah. They, so, they, have, they have learned to adopt, co-opt. Okay. They have learned very well to co-opt. She is still not co-opted. She is still very spirited young lady, but still not uh, going into the root cause. Got it. So, uh, comment, yeah, uh, thanks a lot uh, for answering this. Now, another question uh, that Sumit has raised from uh, Jharkhand. Uh, the question is that what is the importance of developing an alternative based on environment friendly development see these are all vague words let me be frank. environment friendly development these are all very vague words first thing you have to see that as i said today the global ecological footprint of human society is roughly 1.8 times the total productive capacity of the earth so we cannot have absolute development anymore. Very clear. We have to de-develop or de-grow. So you, many of you might also know there is a degrowth movement in the Europe, particularly in Europe. The degrowth movement has grown. Latin America, there is a, a very good vibrance on the degrowth movement. What the degrowth movement recognizes that we have exceeded the Earth's capacity by far. So now. There is no question of growing or developing as a world. That means what does development means? Do development means that you are happier? No, that's a different thing. That's a happiness. That's well-being. So we have to understand the meaning of these worlds, development, growth, well-being, happiness. Today, what the global ecological movement, the more progressive, the more radical global ecological movement is saying, that you should look for global well-being rather than global development. Because development essentially means in the present terminologies, you have to extract more, you have to produce much more, you have to, for producing and for uh, pro uh, extracting, you have to do more capital. So you are not going out of that model and you are destroying the earth even more because you have to develop further. What is development further? You have a 30 uh, foot road, you make a 60 foot road, so you develop. Or if you have uh, one, one car for 20 family, if you have three cars for 20 family, you are more developed. So that kind of development is clearly destructive. Today, that cannot happen. That if that happens, though I agree that this is what is happening, and this is what is causing more and more destabilization in the art system. But today, if you have to save the art systems, 
no, for your children who are young, for your children and their children, we have to have a habitable lot. We have to stop development in the current sense. We have to look into well-being. Well-being looks into how happy you are, how good your societal relationships are, how uh, good your health and education is, how clean your air and water is. Uh, if you are uh, interacting, if your children can enjoy music or they are restless, like if you go to many developed countries, if you see house after home after home after home, family after family after family, very developed, but their children are restless. They live, they are left alone. They are left alone under the glare of a CCTV camera. So this is the kind of development we'll have to completely stop. And this kind of development is intricately linked with capital because all this demands more and more capital. Instead of the parent looking after the child, you put a remote CCTV camera system. What does that need? Not much, 10,000 rupees. So, and who produces that? Not an artisan. It will be a big corporation. So any of this you go, you go into capitalistic development mode. So this is what the capitalistic world is, the paradigm is selling us, that we can have environmentally benign development. We cannot have, very clearly. You have to stop, or you have to drastically reduce extraction. You have to cut down on consumption, drastically cut down on consumption, but selectively. Societies which consume high, their consumption has to be cut down drastically. Like some estimates have shown that if for sustainability, an average US family has to cut down its consumption by at least 80%. That means they have to come down to 20%, one fifth. Will they accept it? No. But that's the reality. That's the environmental reality. That's why this environmentally benign or friendly development is a nonsense. You have to have a sense of well-being and human happiness rather than development and growth. Yeah. Thank you, Kamid. Uh, you rightly said that rather than development, you said one word, I think de-development, sorry. Uh, Degrowth. 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 Yeah. It's a good debate going on. It's a good development going on. So degrowth gives the idea that those societies which consume much above a sustainable level, they have to consume less, they have to extract less, and they have to degrow. Rather than your economy growing 7%, like you know, India says this year our economy out of major economies has grown the most, and we have grown 7%. So in India, when you talk about India, you talk about Ambani, Adani, and you talk about the poorest person. So you have to selectively degrow and give growth or benefits of production and extraction to the people who are much below minimum sustainable levels. There are some theoretical concepts on that. There are some practical concepts on that, which determine what is a sustainable consumption level. Today, we are 8 billion people on the world, 800 crores. So the world which was giving good enough for 400 crore people cannot give same level for 800 crore people. Very clear. And similarly, the cutting down will have to happen at the top, not at the bottom. So it has to be selective. That's what I'm saying repeatedly. The degrowth has to be selective. Uh, okay, thank you, comment. Uh, another question uh, uh, we got uh, uh, in Facebook. Uh, I actually I cannot read the name because it is in Tamil. But the question is, what are the effects of uh, atomic bombs, chemical bombs, bio weapons, etc., to the environment? See, this is a very big question because you have club nuclear bombs, chemical uh, that means normal bombs, and other. Uh, you said what chemical? Third one? That was Nuclear bio bomb. Atomic, bio, bomb. bio. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bio weapons. Bio weapons. So biological weapons. See, the impact of nuclear, which atomic is a, not a right word. In fact, the things that we call atomic bombs are actually nuclear bombs. Actually, your Diwali, uh, Diwali Pataka is an atomic bomb. Because the changes that happen is there is atomic scale. So that's actually an atomic bomb or the bomb that a aeroplane drops in say in a recent war, Russia, Ukraine, where both groups are putting each other. These are 
atomic bombs because they are the change is atomic. But the nuclear bombs, which is what was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and thousands of tests were done also. So those are very very destructive in the sense like the when you drop a new uh, say chemical bomb like. The question said chemical bombs. No. So when you drop a chemical bomb, which is say you uh, like, I don't know how many of you have made uh, this patakas for Diwali earlier in childhood. I made, I made a lot of uh, those. You make charcoal, sulfur, nitrate, and you mix them in the right proportion. You fix them tightly, tie a rope, and it becomes a bomb. So that can be a bomb, and that can be a pataka. So those kind of bombs, once you burst them. The chemicals that come out that do not contaminate the soil and the air for very long, and their range of contamination, unless it's a massive size, is comparatively limited. When you drop a nuclear bomb, the chemicals that are released, the elements that are released, not the chemicals, the elements that are released are many of them are radioactive. First, first thing is its explosive power is far. Comrade, you are not audible. Your voice is not coming. Probably a million times. A million is ten lakhs. No, comrade. You are actually unmute yourself. Earlier, actually, your uh, network went down. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now fine. So once once. Again, uh, your voice is not coming. If comment your voice is not coming. Bombs explode. The element. Uh, is it audible now? Uh, yes, come here. Yeah, and now it's audible. Sorry, somebody is calling and I'm uh, cutting out and it's not going. So oh. that is the problem. So okay. these elements that are coming out of this nuclear bomb are radioactive, means they emit ionizing radiation, which can change your DNA, which can cause genetic defect, which can cause birth defects in children of women who are exposed to this radiation. So this is a far longer effect. Plus, every radioactive element has a half life. That means by the time its radiation level becomes half. And for some of this, this is thousands of years. So if you drop a nuclear bomb today in some place, or you explode a test test bomb, test explosion, the radioactivity and the damage it causes to all kinds of life will be there for tens of thousands of years. So in that area, this effect will con continue for tens of thousands of years. So that's a big difference. And the biological weapons, this again, this is something which we have very little defense against. Because see, if you have a chemical bomb and some chemical gas coming out, you can wear a mask. But if your water supply is contaminated with some very uh, very dangerous virus or bacteria, then you don't even know what is infecting you. And tens of thousands or lakhs or millions of people can die or get some disease. So biological weapons attack directly on our physiology, our, our metabolism, our bodies. So that is the big danger. And it is not only our bodies. 
because even if you are trying to put that bomb to kill or defeat other human beings another army this is impacting thousands of other species of life which are in that area so that's a big danger so from chemical bombs which are like patakas big big size very big size patakas you go to nuclear bombs which is tens of thousands of years this effect will last in a very large area and biological weapons we have very little defenses because we are all biological machines so it will directly impact us oh yeah thank you kamil now uh, it's a last question and actually it's my question uh, recently i got to heard about um, eco socialism so mm-hmm. and also i got to know that uh, there is a conflict between some political think- thinkers that advocates eco socialism and also the classic uh, classical marxists that disregard this eco socialist so how can we solve this contradiction between them and uh, briefly can you please also explain about eco socialism what actually it is last what was the last part how uh, can we uh, how can we uh, solve this contradiction between uh, the eco socialist and the political thinkers like marxist thinkers okay see uh, one uh, one problem with the uh, classical marxist interpretation of the current political situation see we have seen that in uh, soviet union the original soviet model very clearly we have seen part of this in uh, early china they had no different models or different understanding about exploitation of nature that means classical marxism they put equity between humans as a prime thing equitable sharing but the equitable sharing with nature with the understanding the nature is the ultimate authority to determine where is the limit where is the limit of extraction what is the limit of destabilization because one thing when i say destabilization our system our systems destabilization is something we do or contribute to when you do a large scale change in any of the arts natural system natural state all the natural states of the art natural systems of the art are what we call complex adaptive systems they are adaptive if you push them a little bit they adjust and sometime come back they take time but they come back like if you deforest a portion a land and if you leave it for 10 years the forest will grow back so it will adapt but if you deforest a very large amount or if you increase the ph of the soil to very high level or decrease the ph of the soil to very low level the entire forest will die the same thing is happening in many of the mangrove areas because of the salinity increase many mangroves even without cutting the mangroves the mangroves are drying because you have changed the condition of the part of the earth system so this is the question which classical marxists didn't understand course is nothing against them at that point of time because at that point of time destabilizing our system was not a reality today we are in a situation where the climate systems are about to fall where several three of the earth systems are about to be breached so today if some political uh, person or political society say that we will not deviate from that position and not give primacy to ecology or nature because this very clear understanding that whether we are human or whether you are a simpanji or whether you are a bird or a butterfly or an insect all of this operate within nature within nature's limits and boundaries and mostly within nature's laws though we might think that we have conquered nature that never is possible because that is what is your life sustaining system how can you conquer that no you can adapt to that so this problem of classical marxist understanding of not accepting the larger natural reality which is eco socialism is uh, all about that eco comes in the ecology comes in and ecology is the prime gets the primacy not what you develop 
as your economic model not what you develop as your social model and politics is nothing but economic and social models of interrelationship that's what politics is so basically if you do not accept that nature is to be prime given primacy for determining your economic and social models and relationship then you end up in that and that is a pro how do you resolve it there is i don't think there is uh, more than one or two ways one is very clear and you don't know who will win one is a very clear political struggle whether it is a revolution or whether it is a uprising whatever you call it and whoever wins temporarily you don't know who wins that model will go for some time then nature will give a clear signal whether you are right or wrong so if you are adaptive enough you are receptive enough you can even change again but without one the political uh, large scale political struggle of either revolution or uprising uh, and uh, i don't think the other model of negotiations uh, sort of uh, international uh, political khichatani uh, what we do it's going anywhere that was thought to be the model that will work that has been given over the last see from the time of uh, creation of league of nations and then the united nations that has been the model which has been given primacy that we will negotiate in the framework of nations nation states see that is the model of global negotiation and settlements that whatever we negotiate we negotiate in the framework of nation states the nation states their governments are member of the united nations so united nations is not the nations in terms of people and societies these are united governments of the world that's where the negotiations take place but that we are clearly seeing that that space and that model of negotiation is failing it has not served our purpose so now some new model has to evolve i don't think anyone has complete idea of what that new model will be or how this uh, resolve how this will be resolved but the process of resolving this is partly negotiation dialogue negotiation but partly people's uprising has to uh, play a major role and for that uprisings don't happen on their own at least some long term uprisings uh, transformational uprisings don't happen on their own sometime it comes up and it's again uh, suppressed like lot of us had a high hope when suddenly in the heartland of capitalism the occupy wall street movement came up suddenly i'm saying uh, 2011 but it started before 2006 7 actually 2000 uh, 1999 bubble the economic hardships all this contributed to that then the uh, liberal economic policies that uh, loose monetary policies all this contributed to that uh, which popularized a large section of even the us population so you don't know when this kind of uprising happens and even when this uprising happens whether these uprisings will uh, lead to a long term transformational change but that is the only way that we can see towards at least in the near future uh, yes comrade thank you comrade uh, one thing i just uh, want to mention over here like uh, you went to uh, scope 26 uh, conference and then after also uh you got to see uh, there is a uh, there was a paper that has been published or presented uh, from the various governments and they uh, said one thing that uh, now or never term for the ecology like if we'll not uh, go into sustaining our life like our ecology then after 10 uh, years what is going to happen we don't know so what should be your message uh, uh, to to the political parties uh, of india that are like that are going through the like they have progressive politics so what should be your message to them see this now and never it's not uh, let me correct this it's not it didn't come out of the cop it came before the cop the cop happened in november but uh, the ip is 2021 one in october 2021 and both this report clearly showed that if we do not reduce our total emissions and reducing emission means you have to reduce consumption you have to reduce your uh, luxury things everything because uh, consumption comes from there emissions come from those consumption so if we do not reduce our 
emissions by at least 45 percent at least 45 percent that means nearly half like if somebody an average emission is four tons you have to bring it down to two tons huh? that means a very drastic change you can uh, convert it into money if somebody is spending one lakh rupees per month and if you tell unless you spend 50,000 you limit your spending to 50,000 rupees a month we are going to a disaster how will they react as a person as a but that is the reality that's what the scientific reality is ipcc is no communist organization ipcc do not believe in eco socialism so it's pure scientific economic body mainly science but also economic and finance so ipcc is saying unless we reduce our emissions by at least 45 percent by 2030 you might not be able to save the earth from going into a total destabilized state which is called hothouse so it will be probably going into that state you will probably not be able to control even two degrees celsius which is the final red line that scientists have long said so this is a, a clear message to all political parties if they are in the right mind that today we don't have time for ped lagao dharti bachao chalo ek vyakti ek ped ek bachcha ek ped this this is a long dead is no of no use of course i'll not say no use you lagao ek ped ek bachcha ek ped it might help you you feel better no, some but for the art systems it doesn't really matter anymore so today what we need a drastic change and this change has to come within the next seven eight years that means this needs a drastic political systemic change and this also is a clear signal that today if political parties fail to mobilize large masses on this message then they will also be held responsible and accountable in the future because in the future when our younger people they face a very very wide different art very difficult art they will not leave any of us without questioning without strong criticism so that needs to be taken into mind and how history will look into your politics today or my politics today needs to be clearly understood by political parties but unfortunately most political parties we don't see getting this message so that's the saddest part that's the most dangerous but this yeah. is the clear message yeah thank you comrade so actually it's a series of you know uh, webinars uh, for the uh, 12th uh, party conference uh, all india party congress that is going to be happening happen in uh, koikor so what should be your message to our party workers that uh, whom they are going to attend and who are, who are they are working uh, in the field see my message is very clear that many of you like you and many others who are airso you are you are younger persons my message is very clear it is your future is the arts future so go all out spread this to as many people as possible but with clear demarcation of leveraging points because hitting your head on the wall doesn't help but finding out where the weak spots are helps if you hit at a weak spot you might break through but if you keep going and even with the hammer if you keep hitting on a concrete wall it doesn't help much so find out the leveraging points go out take this message to as many people as possible in a very large scale small scale one meeting two meeting doesn't really matter much but if that meeting is repl replicated thousand times a thousand places that has a meaning but if we do not do it today my message is very clear then you yourself have to blame are to blame by yourself in the future and your children and all others so that's a clear message and we don't have like all of us have seen these messages we don't have another planet we don't have an alternative place to go uh, elon musk is not taking us to mars it's not possible we have to live on this earth that means we have to have a habitable earth for not only the rich but all of us and that message is sadly lacking amongst most poorer people most poorer people think in their immediate vicinity they think that because these two trees were cut my things is bad so this message needs to be taken this is not just because of these two trees cut or this little bit of pollution here 
This is a global capitalist consumer extractive consumption capitalism model, which has created this problem. So you have to attack that and find out the leveraging points. One leveraging point for any uh, group of people is the political action. The political action can happen multiple places, not only during the votes. Yeah, thank you, comrade. Uh, so yeah, now it's over. And I would like to thank all uh, the viewers who are uh, uh, listening to this session. And also, uh, nonetheless, I would like to thank uh, Comrade Swami Dattu has given his, his time uh, for this session. Uh, thank you.